This is Thursday, April 20th, 2017. We are at the Bedford Veterans Administration Medical Center in Bedford, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is me, and we are privileged to have with us today John R. Cardillo. Welcome, John. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born March 4th, 1948. And where were you born? I was born in Waltham, Massachusetts. And where do you currently live? I live here, ma'am. At the Bedford VA? At the Bedford VA. Uh, I've been here eight years. Okay. And your marital status? I'm a widower. Do you have children? I have two sons. One's 45, one's 41. And do you have grandchildren? Yes, I do. I have two. One's a uh, sophomore, UMass Amherst. My granddaughter will be going to college next year. Yeah, congratulations. Tell us a little bit about Waltham growing up. Waltham was kind of like Mayberry. Nobody ever locked their doors. Nobody ever yelled at you if you went and picked an apple or a grape. Nobody ever um, mind if you played in the streets. The cars, they didn't speed. There was no need for speed bumps. Um, people knew each other well. And if somebody made a couple of pies, somebody would give somebody else another pie. It was like that back then. It was very nice living back then. It's not like now. Okay. And when and where did you enter the military? I entered the military. I enlisted in Waltham. Mm -hmm. I did. My two best friends enlisted with me, a Larry Mandel and a Joseph Leonard. We were supposed to go together, but we didn't. J Joseph left December 17th. Larry left December 19th. I left December 21st, 1965. And what branch of the service? It was the Navy. And why the Navy? I wanted to see the world. I thought I would see the world. We fantasized that, but little did we know. <laughs> we didn't see much of the world. And uh, where did you go for basic? We went to, I went to uh, boot camp in Chicago, Great Lakes. And at that time, they were just building the new cement mods. My first five, six weeks, I was in old wooden ones when the wind blew through it. And I was in there in December. So, you know, it was cold. John, was this the first time you were away from the area? For a long period of time, yes. It was scary. And I was separated from my other two friends. Uh, what did you like or not like about BASIC besides the windy walls? Oh, BASIC training was Good and bad, it, 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 it taught me structure that I never had before. It taught me when to say yes and when to say no. And it taught me when not to volunteer. I get that one a lot. Don't yeah. ever volunteer for anything. No, don't ever volunteer. And how long were you in basic? I did, I think it was two months of basic. And I went home for uh, two weeks. I got orders to Brooklyn Navy Yard. I spent two weeks there waiting for a ship to come back from the Mediterranean. The ship came in, it was the USS Tiana, AGS-15. We boarded that ship. 
with a bunch of other people, may I add. And we got friends with some of them and not friends with some of them. As you know, you end up with a group of people you like and you some people you don't really like, but you don't go with them. You avoid them or whatever. While you were at BASIC, did you receive any advanced training? Well, I didn't actually get any advanced training. They wanted me to go to core school. Then they found out I didn't have a high school diploma. So they just put me out as a seaman. And I ended up uh, in Vietnam three times. OK, let's get you back on your ship for the first time. And uh, what was it? Um, tell us a little more about your first ship, the Tanner. The USS Tanner. Okay. It, it was the mother's ship mm -hmm. that if I got to leave, they sent me with them like to Hong Kong, Thailand. We went through the Panama Canal with the Tanner. We went to Mexico with the Tanner. We went all over, you know, like from New York to Virginia with the Tanner to New Jersey with the Tanner, back to Brooklyn Navy Yard with the Tanner. It had a lot of maintenance had to be done with that with the USS Tanner before it could go into, I, uh, Vietnam. What kind of duties did you perform on the Tanner? On the Tanner, we were just, you know, seamen. Anything and everything, from chipping paint to mopping floors to cleaning pots and pans. Okay. And um, how long were you on the Tanner? We were on the Tanner until we got to the lighthouse that was Vung Tau, Vietnam. Long Tau. Vung, Vung Tau. Okay. And then they started putting the little boats over the side, the, you know, small boats over the side, with the PBRs, swift boats. They had sounding boats. They had three holes with a lot of boats and equipment in them. And I got assigned to a boat. So we had a learn. We went back to the Philippines for a while and did some uh, more basic training. Actually, we ran with like uh, special op teams, carrying uh, telephone poles, learning how to uh, let a ramp down for an LTD to unload troops. When the back off, actual fire being on the actual fire, uh, learning about C4, things like that. And then we went back to our boats and went up and down the Mekong Delta. John, what did you know about Vietnam before you got there? Nothing at all. And describe, if you can, your first day of seeing Vietnam. My first day of seeing Vietnam was like, people would say, you know, like, don't wander off by yourself. Stay with a group. And it was the first time anybody ever handed me a 45 and a <laughs> AK-15. Did that kind of make you nervous? <laughs> yes, uh -huh. it kind of made me very nervous. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was in for. Okay. So now you're on the boat and you're patrolling the Mekong Delta. Yes. 
Uh, describe what uh, life on a swift boat was like. Well, we kind of were supposed to be sleeping in like four hours mm -hmm. and off on four hours. And we would go out for three or four days at a time with no sleep at all, actually. Uh, the um, corpsman would give us dexedrines to keep us awake. And after about three days of taking dexedrines, we were shooting up in trees, shooting anything that moved. But we were told to shoot anything that moved anyway. As long as it wasn't a water buffalo. <laughs> Let's get into the more kind of mundane detail. What were you wearing while you were on the Swift River boat? When I was on the boat, I was I wore short tennis shoes and a, a vest. The vest, as in the yeah, bulletproof vest. Okay. Yeah. And were you wearing helmets and stuff? Um, no, because if you fasten a strap on a helmet and you got into the water, you would drown. So if you just put the helmet on and you move around, well, it fell off anyway. And what to do about eating? We had K-rations from 1928. They had three. Chesterfields of palm oils in them and the food and stuff like that. But we traded it for monkey meat. We traded some of the, the K ration when we, we went into little villages mm -hmm. and we got monkey meat and the French taught them how to make bread. And it was some of the best, you know, buns or rolls. I ever had over there. It was over there. Interesting. Yeah. So when you were going to a village, uh, were you folks sure that they were friendly or not friendly? Oh, we went in heavily armed. Uh huh. And um, we weren't supposed to be there anyway, so we were very careful. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're patrolling the Mekong Delta, um, what would be the distance? In From, miles, uh, like uh, were you traveling like 50 miles a day, 100 miles a day? Um, we got accommodations for surveying and uh, the, the most miles. And they gave you a award to the USS Tanner. Guess who we were radio back to? Mm -hmm. we, 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 we were going back and forth, back and forth, except during the uh, 68th. The Tet Offensive, we didn't move very much. We just fired all over, you know. It was, it was a horror show there. We were taking people out of the water, bodies out of the water, bodies out of trees. Was this the first time or the only time you encountered the enemy, or was this uh, pretty much a given? No, we encountered the enemy here and there. Um, our first loss was Charles Ratsmith from Texas, and um, his father had just sent him that Christmas a 10-gallon hat, and he was on a helm with that 10-gallon hat on, and he got killed. I am sorry to hear that. He was one of the nicest guys you could have met, too. Mm -hmm. He was down to earth, southern boy. Okay, John, so how, um, what was the, in the length of your first mission on the Mekong Delta? Well, we were supposed to do like six, six, and six. I was supposed to do six months, six mm -hmm. months, six months, like that. So you were on the first mission for six months. Yeah, we got, took some bullet holes, uh, you know, stuff like that. Went to floating barges, got patched up, 
went back out on patrols, you know, went into dry docks, you know, after our three, four days out, you know, went in towns, little towns or whatever. Went to, went to Saigon one time, left the hotel, was about 20 feet away from the hotel, and the hotel blew up right behind us. Wow. So, you know, we really had to be very careful. Mm -hmm. John, while you were on these patrols, uh, were you being uh, informed of what else was happening? We were on radio all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you get news from the outside world? Uh, uh, radio, um, like, Good Morning Vietnam type mm -hmm. deal. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. We listen to ball games and things like that. Uh -huh. Listen to president's speeches. And wow. So did you get to uh, hear the Red Sox in the World Series? Yeah, we did, yeah. Wow. Yeah. We did. Mm -hmm. We kind of took it slow when they were playing, real slow. <laughs> Well, mo most of the time we were going, we didn't want anybody to hear us. Right. You know, we, we were called Brown River Sailors because we were in about three feet of water sometimes. And we would be churning up mud. There'd be two 360s, Mercury motors in them boats, and they could get up and move. And John, when you were, when you were doing on these missions, did you ever get any time off? Little R and R. Yeah, we we went to we went to <coughs> the Philippines quite a bit. We went to um, Hong Kong. We went to uh, Tokyo. Um, we went to um, a couple other places. I can't even remember right now. So you got to see quite a bit of Southeast Asia. Yes, I did, yeah. Were you uh, promoted along the way? Y yeah, I made. I actually made E5, but I was getting out, and I, it, I needed like two more weeks to sew it on if I wanted mm -hmm. to sew the E5 on. Uh-huh. And, John, you mentioned before the interview that you contracted Agent Orange or you were exposed to it. Uh, was it during one of these missions? I, we used to unload 55 gallon drums of it from the first time, my first tour of it. I was unloading these 55 gallon drums and it was leaking. Oh no. And they were spraying it all over. It wasn't orange. Sometimes it was a purple spray, a yellow spray, a green spray. But they were like crop dusters. So it was enough food on our clothes. And nobody told you at the time that this stuff was a carcinogen. Oh, Dow Chemical, it won't hurt anything. You can drink it. That was Dow Chemical telling us this. Let's get you back now on mission number two. That would be Ted Offensive. Okay. That's when the holy heck blew out of everything over there. And where were you when holy heck broke out? We were actually going towards Cambodia. And um, we took a lot of fire that we would didn't normally take. We were looking in the land, and there was more explosions and more napalm put down than I ever saw before. I'll never forget the smell of the napalm or just the uh, sight of it, the sight of these flames laying this stuff down. It was a dramatic experience, man. It really was. And how long were you in that situation? 68, six months almost. Six, almost six months. 
And you mentioned picking up bodies and hopefully survivors. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of times we would put like teams, op teams in, and we would wait for them on a certain hour in the morning on the dark to, to pull them out to get them out of there. We would throw like tow ropes and we would felt a tug on our six tow ropes. We knew they to, to go with these people. I met one of them. He was a doctor in Florida. I went to a and he he, he, was, he says, I remember, you know, the, them, them pulling us out. You were one of the guys that did that. And I said, yeah. He goes, you might have pulled me out of one of them places one time. I said, I may have, but, I, you know, I just can't, you know, be sure. I pulled you out. I think so many faces with so many people. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was it, uh, when was the end of mission number two? Was it like uh, toward the middle of 68, end of 68? Well, we were always over there mm -hmm. during the holidays. So we were relieved and they were over there during the summer. We went over there in the fall we were always over there for Christmas and New Year's. That's why, like, New Year's we were in Hong Kong, or Christmas we were in the Philippines, or um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, or someplace like that. Yeah. So you were on active duty in Vietnam when the election of 68 occurred and Nixon was elected. Uh, what were your feelings about that? Didn't have time to have any feelings, really. Uh -huh. All right, now you're you've been still in Southeast Asia. Mission number three. The third mission was a real bad mission for me. My mother actually turned on the TV and found out where I was. My mother never knew that I was in Vietnam or my father. So <coughs> my mother was telling me that the third time never fails and sure and heck. A chopper dropped off mail and got shot right off the flight deck. I tried to jump in after the four guys in the chopper. It was going down right off the flight deck. The guy, and I got grabbed, and they said, no, the blades would rip your legs off. But all I could think about is them guys drowning, and they drowned it. I mean, I wasn't trying to be a hero or anything like that. I just, I saw so many deaths and so many body bags that if I could do something for poor people, and we always had to read a knife on us, and then they would cut right off, you know, the seat belts right off, they could have came out, uh, they would have, you know, swam up. The water was so clear that you could see it going right down. And they dropped off meal for us. John, I know uh, recounting these experiences is never easy, but I thank you for opening up about this. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I feel that somebody had to say something about it. Mm -hmm. And how long was your third and what turned out to be your final mission? My, I actually didn't do the whole six months because I got discharged in February 28, 1969. And 
we went, I believe, to Guam to get some work done. And my, about five or six of our names were called. And we would go to, the, we flew to the Philippines. And then we went to Angel Analyst City. That was the airport in the Philippines. And we flew to Hawaii and we flew home to San Francisco where we, I was really, really, really upset getting spit at and yelled at and everything. Those would be from the anti-war protesters. Yeah. And we, we were told to stay on the black tar fat. Don't go near them or else we would be in trouble. But they were throwing stuff and spitting at us and yelling obscenities to us. And we were told to keep our mouth shut. Okay. So um, how did you get back to Boston? I had money on the books and I got a ticket. And I had me all my stuff home, what I had left of it. And uh, I got home. And I didn't tell anybody I was coming home. And I, it was about six feet of, Six feet high snowbanks or more. Of in, course. In, in March 1st, 1969. And I took a cab from Logan to Waltham to my grandma's house. I know she would be there. And I knocked on the door, and it's a Doberman Pinscher come running down, barking at me. My aunt had bought a Doberman Pinscher. And my grandma come down, yelling at me, and we're Italian. And my grandma is from Italy, and she was yelling at me in Italian. And I forgot a lot of the Italian, you know, but it, it was coming back a little bit, and she hugged me and kissed me, and my mom came out and hugged and kissed me. My father came over. My Uncle Joe came downstairs. So it was, you know, it was all right. I didn't have no, didn't have any, uh, all I had was uniform. I didn't have any clothes to wear either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, coming home February, uh, late February 69 when they had like two big snowstorms. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the first time you had seen snow in four years, right? Yes, yes. No palm trees, <laughs> no 80 degrees, 90 degrees. Not for a while yet. No. Mm -hmm. So, John, tell us a bit about um, becoming a civilian again. Well, I had, uh, I had bought a set of gabardines, Navy, Navy uh, dress blues, and I had 11 ribbons, and my father thought that was just peachy keen. He took me to the Sons of Italy. He took me to the VFW. He took me to the Elks. He took me to the Moose. He, <laughs> he took me all, all over the place. I thought I was going to become an alcoholic. <laughs> but then I just told him, the pup. I got to rest a little bit, and I took some money, I went out and bought some clothes. I went to this place called the Chess King mm -hmm. at the time, and I bought some clothes to the Chess King. I went to Boston, and I bought a, some shoes out of Flag Brothers. I bought some shoes, and I started my uh, bike over again. So to be it. Now you received your GED uh, while you were uh, first in the Navy. Did you uh, pursue any other bits of higher education? Um, I entered community callers in Chelsea Community Callers. 
And uh, Paul Roy hired me, and they sent me to Chicago to become a lubrication oil specialist for scarcities of oils and, you know, grease and things like that, when, you know, burning points and things like that. When they were no longer good, you had to replace them. Um, grease blocks, when they jammed up, had to crawl underneath the machine and then, pull, you know, do them and things like that. Uh -huh. But actually, I started out as a block boy, and I worked my way into that. I was there 20 years. Did you uh, go to community college through the GI Bill? No, I, I never I never went. Oh, okay. I went and I seen it and everything. I never started it. Okay, so because that's... Paul Roy got me right away. Oh, okay. And did you um, take advantage of any other veterans programs? Well, I bought houses. Okay. Did you live in Waltham? I lived in Waltham. <coughs> my first son was born in Waltham. And my second son was born in Waltham. My first son started school in Waltham. And he come home talking some Spanish from kindergarten. And my wife didn't care for that very much. So we moved out to South Pearl. We bought another house in South Pearl, which was very nice, but it was an hour drive for me. Yeah. Every uh -huh. day. Mm -hmm. And there was a buffalo farm out there. I think I remember that, yeah. And we, were, we could walk, it was, we were about 100 yards from the buffalo farm, the ranch house, the ranch I bought with an acre and a quarter, had a pool in the backyard. My two sons loved it, you know. Pretty nice. Now, earlier you mentioned the, uh, the ribbons that were on your navy blues. I, uh, what kind of medals and accommodations did you get? They were just, you know, unit citation, mm -hmm. presidential citations, um, a meatball, you know, things like that. It was, it was really nothing special. Okay. And uh, after, did you join any veteran service organizations? Or DAV? So, yeah, DAV. Yeah, DAV, VFW, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> John, have you, uh, you noticed over the years uh, whether Vietnam veterans have been treated better now than they were then? I didn't really know too many Vietnam veterans. Joey Leonard came home, mm -hmm. and he walked in front of a train. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Jimmy McGrath came home, and he left his car running with the garage door closed. Ronald Buglioni drove his car off the bridge. Again, it's never easy to recount details like that. So we thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <coughs> now, John, did either of your son express an interest in joining the military? I told him I cut their fingers off if they did. I guess that wasn't a good thing. They went to college. Right. <laughs> that, that, okay, that's good. That was, that's good. <laughs> Well, I said that, but, you know, I just told him, I said, you know, I don't want you in the service. You never know what's going to happen. Right. Well, what do you think about the current engagements, Iraq, Afghanistan? Oh, the 90-day war? Mm-hmm. I think some of them guys get treated better than us. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't begrudge him or anything like that. Right. But, you know, mm. let's face it, we went through heck when we came home. Mm 
I know you did. And a lot of people learn from what we went through, mm -hmm. not to treat them like that. Mm -hmm. Now, John, how long have you been dealing with the effects of Agent Orange? Well, I've been real. I've been here for eight years, so I came in here hospice. I got holes in my lungs. It's not from smoking. <laughs> They're doing, uh, they do kidney checks on me, they do a lot of blood checks on me, things like that. I really don't want to die here. I'm looking for an apartment now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still drive a car. So, you know, I, I had a car up until last, a year ago, my nephew, Total my BMW, <laughs> right? You know. All right, John. Is there anything you would like to add before we end this interview? I just want to say my prayers are with all you have a vest out there from World War One to Korea. The young kids, I shouldn't say, young men that were in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. Mm -hmm. Just God bless you all. Thank you for your service. And is there anything you'd like to say about the Bedford VA? It's not a bad place at all, really. Okay. John Cardillo, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you for having me.